Hello, my name is Ken McBride. Welcome to Chess Match. This is Learn Chess with the Rochester Chess Center. I have a couple things I want to show first about how the pieces move and things about the board, and then we'll get right to a game. The thing I want to point out here is that when you look at an empty board, you'll see different color squares on the board. In chess, we call those white squares or black squares, or light squares and dark squares. You'll also notice that we have letters and numbers on the sides of our board. That is for the grid system so we can identify which squares we have. For instance, if I put this piece on the square here, we would say that is on the letter E and the number five. We call that square E5. We have three different kinds of lines in chess. We have what's called a file, which just is one square in front of another square in front of another square. Kind of like if you've heard a teacher say, line up in a single file. We have a rank, which is the line that goes side to side on the chessboard. And then we have a diagonal. Most of the chess pieces move along one of those kinds of lines. All right, well, why don't we actually get towards the game? All right, here's a quick introduction of the different chess pieces. We'll start with the rook. The rook moves on files. So it can, as far as he wants to go, as long as the path is clear, he can move forwards or backwards or he can move sideways along the rank, as far as he wants to go, as long as the path is clear. Now the fun part happens for any of the chess pieces when somebody's in their way. For instance, if this rook sees somebody in this way, it's going to make a capture. And in chess, you capture by landing on that piece's square. Now that piece has been captured, goes off the board, and it won't play any more chess. Okay? That is the rook, just files and ranks. The next chess piece we have to talk about would be the bishop. The bishop moves on the other kind of line, the diagonal. And you'll notice every square on the diagonal is the same color. So this bishop, we would say, moves on the black squares or the dark squares. Again, he can move as far as he would like, as long as the path is clear. He maybe wants to move a long ways, or maybe he wants to move just a short ways. But again, as far as the path is clear. Combining those two pieces, or the powers of those two pieces, would be the queen. The queen can move on a file, or a rank, or a diagonal, as far as the path is clear. So maybe the queen on this move wants to move down the file. Her next move might be along a rank. And for the sake of argument, let's say she moves on the diagonal. Again, as far as she wants to, if the path is clear that the queen is the strongest piece in chess. But the most important piece in chess is the king. Now the king moves on files, ranks, and diagonals as well. However, the king only walks one space at a time. Now the king could go one, and then one. Now if somebody walks too close, like let's say this rook, we're too close to the king, he moves here, the king might be able to capture him. He just goes one space. But we did say the king is the most important piece in chess. If somebody is chasing the king, you have to say, check. That means your king is in danger, you must save it. And in chess, there's three ways out of check. You could try to capture the piece. This bishop might capture the rook. You could block a piece. The bishop might block the rook. Remember, the rook could only move as far as the path was clear and the path's only clear to the bishop. Or the king might walk out on its own, go one space. But if we have a case like this, the rook is saying check, the bishop cannot capture the rook, the bishop cannot block, and the king can't walk away because of the queen as well as the rook. All right, the next piece we will talk about is a knight. The knight's this funny looking guy. And he does not move in straight lines. He makes the shape of a capital L. So he might go one, two, turn his head, and go one. On his next move, maybe he goes one, two, turns his head, and goes one. Now you'll notice that every time a knight moves, he changes what color square he's sitting on. Right now he's on black. He'd make a move, and he would land on white. So if your knight hasn't changed what color he's sitting on, you know he has not moved correctly. Another strange thing that for the knight 
is that it does not matter if his path is clear or not. In the case up here, actually, let's use this. This knight sees an enemy queen. The knight can say, oh, no, there's all these pieces in the way. Wait, I can jump over. So he would go one, two, and turn. Now, you don't capture anything you jumped over. That would be a different game. But in chess, you capture what you land on. Okay, and the last one that we'll talk about is the pawn, which, even though it's the weakest unit in chess, it's the most confusing one to many players. Now, think of the pawn as like a little baby. It only knows how to go forwards. Pawns do not know how to go backwards, nor do they know how to go sideways. So this pawn would go forwards. He kind of crawls forward, and pawns can go one space forwards. And maybe this pawn would go one space forwards. You'd say, that's pretty boring. But any time a pawn hasn't moved yet, if he's still on his original square, he gets to walk two spaces. One, two spaces. This pawn might also walk one, two spaces. Now these pawns are blocking each other, but they don't capture head on. In order for a pawn to make a capture, he has to capture on a diagonal one space going forwards. So if black's bishop were on f5, the white pawn would capture by walking diagonally forwards one space. At this point, now the black pawn can just walk down the board. The white pawn might say, I'll walk down the board. The black pawn might walk again. White would move again. And when the white pawn reaches the last or the eighth rank, he gets a reward. Your pawn is what we call promotes. He can become either a rook, a queen, a bishop, or a knight. The player playing white gets to choose, and in most cases, they'll choose a queen. You put the queen where the pawn was, and the pawn goes off the board. If white already has a queen, you may still get a second queen, or you may still get a queen. White says, I'll take a queen. He doesn't have a queen, but we can use an upside down rook, and that shows us a queen. So you're allowed to have multiple queens in chess, but that's just a short primer of how all the pieces move. Okay, thank you. All right, when you are setting up the pieces on the board, the way that I remember when I, w when I was taught is you put all the pawns in the second rook in the second rank. Or if you're black, you put all the pawns in the seventh rank. After that, you'd say, which of the chess pieces looks a little bit like a castle tower? That would be the rook. So the rooks go in the corners. Now, if somebody had attacked the castle, the person that defends the castle would be the knights. So the knights go next to the rooks. And you've got two of one kind of chess piece left. That's the bishop, so we'll put the bishop next. They used to actually be called advisors. And then the queen and the king will go in the middle. This is a part that many players confuse, or get confused about. But you put the queen on her own color. Or other players remember it by putting the queen on the square that matches her dress. This is a white queen. She goes on a white square. It's a black queen. She goes on a black square. And kings don't wear dresses. They wear robes. So he doesn't get the same color shoes as his dress. All right, thank you. And we can see how it works in practice. We have here our players are Catherine and Catherine. Okay, the bishops only go diagonally, so she stayed on the black squares. And one thing you'll notice is people usually aim towards the center four squares. That'd be e4, e5, d4, and d5. Go ahead, Catherine. It's also very important at the beginning of the game to bring out pieces like your bishops or your knights. The player who usually does that first has a big advantage.
Okay, now this is a special move that Catherine just did called castling, where she moved her king two spaces towards the rook, and the rook jumps over the top. The reason we do that is the king is the most important piece we have in the game, and it's important to get him tucked off to safety. She's now behind a wall of three pawns. Okay, now ladies, you want to get you want to get your bishop out, and you want to do something with your king, right? So figure out where your king's going to go, and figure out where your bishop's going to go. Now, why are you putting a piece back to bed? Does that make a lot of sense? Okay, but he's already playing, so you don't usually put him back to to bed unless you chased him there. It doesn't need to be on a starting square. We want to develop our pieces. Okay, now this, up till now, we played a pretty good game here about not having any pieces that can just be captured for free. But an important part of chess is counting how many times you're attacking a certain piece and how many times somebody's defending a certain piece. Right now on e5, white is attacking with the knight, going one, two, and making the L, as well as the bishop that can go diagonally. So we have a case of hanging pieces. You always have to watch out for those. Okay, and that was pretty important because since the bishop did not capture it, you just run away and get your piece to safety. Now the game's still even. Now that's exactly what we were talking about earlier. There were two attackers on this and only one person protected it, so Catherine just captured. Somebody in chess, you, you realize somebody is having a pretty good game when they start seeing the possible captures they have. If somebody takes something of yours, you better take something of theirs. still needs to improve on your team, which pieces. Those are the ones to move.
and I just check. Now, check just means somebody is chasing the king, and it's very important to notice that when you're in check, you have to choose how to get out of check. So this knight's chasing the king, and we could either capture to get out of check, you could try to block to get out of check, or you could move your king to get out of check. Okay, so far in this game we're pretty even. Uh, you'll notice that both players have a queen, both players have two rooks, both players have a knight. The only difference here is one, two, three, four, five, six pawns are playing against one, two, three, four, five pawns. So it's a pretty close game because we've realized that whenever somebody captures us, we need to capture them back. And it's very important to count how many times a person is being protected and how many times it's being attacked. So I would say today's tip of the day would be if somebody takes you, you want to capture them back. Okay, thank you very much for watching, and we'll be back with another segment of another game that will be probably a little bit more advanced game. Thank you. Chess Match is sponsored by the Rochester Chess Center, which has been serving the Rochester chess community for over 24 years. Welcome back to Chess Match, where you learn chess with the Rochester Chess Center. In this segment, we are going to introduce a chess clock. You'll see they're both set for five minutes, and the way this works is when one player pushes their button, the other person's time starts to tick down. When they make a move and they push their button, their clock stops, and the first player's time starts to tick down. Okay, if, you, if one person sees the other players run out of time, that's a lot like winning the game, or that's a lot like checkmate, which wins the game. All right, we'll reset the clock, and we'll start with our players, John and Krish. Okay, this time we're playing an Italian game opening. Okay, usually knights don't go to the edge of the board. They only look, like to look towards the middle. Okay, now when there was a check here, this is one of the two best ways out of check. The other one, normally you'd, you'd block with a pawn here, which makes the bishop feel kind of silly. But blocking with the bishop, he said, my sleeping bishop is not as good as your bishop that's doing something, so let's trade them off. Trade off active pieces for inactive ones. That's what white wants to do. Okay, Krish is concentrating an attack with a bishop and a knight, aiming at f2. John has to figure out how to deal with that. Okay, so the knight came into f2, making a fork. And John says, yeah, I saved my queen, but you don't have time to take my rook because this queen wants to play checkmate. So they're both attacking the weak f-pawn squares, f2 and f7 specifically. a good way to defend. <laughs> Capture the piece that's going to help the checkmate, as well as the knight guards f7. And even attacks the enemy queen.
you'll notice that John did not want to castle in this case because that would let the bishop get a free check. So he did not castle saying, oh, knight, take a free move and play what we call discovered check. He just moved his rook over and has to leave his king in the center for a little while longer. We had said earlier that if you're behind in material, you need to be attacking. John is certainly attacking. Okay, you might remember we talked about a fork. This knight is chasing the queen and a rook, as well as allowing the bishop to chase the queen. When the knight was in the way, the bishop doesn't chase the queen. Now that the knight moves, the bishop discovers an attack on the queen. We call that discovered attack. Okay, and John said my knight was going to get captured for nothing, so we tried to capture here. Although, it's possible that he could have tried to protect the knight with this bishop, where the bishop would have chased the queen and then the bishop helps the knight out. But he thought he couldn't save the knight, so he got something for it. Uh-oh, the hanging piece. The bishop captured the queen, and white's now feeling very happy about his game. Okay, White's willing to allow trades because he's ahead now by basically a queen. Black has to do something about his rook because this battery aims at the rook. Well, that did prevent the queen from taking the rook, but... Now the king has to escape. <laughs> Flee or die Sorry. for the black king. Okay. Now this is a move called en passant. Back about 500 years ago, when pawns were first allowed to walk two spaces on their opening move, they realized if this pawn walked two spaces, he deprived an enemy pawn of a capture. So they put in the rule where this pawn, for one turn only, gets to say, I'm going to capture you as if you had moved only one space. That is actually a real rule of chess called en passant or in passing.
not going to let me walk into check. Okay, so try to end this as cleanly as you can. Okay, there was a chance here to play checkmate. The queen goes next to the enemy king. Mm. That's her favorite place where mm. she's protected. Mm. I was thinking okay. of a different Okay, okay. but there's a different pattern that I'm sure John has in mind. I didn't want to use my turn. Trying. Okay. Check. Nice. Okay, checkmate. And, and this is one of the first checkmating patterns that most people learn called well, some people call it the ladder checkmate, where one piece controls one rank, then the next piece comes in and controls the next rank, and the next piece will come in and control the next rank, and they'll work all the way to the edge of the board when the king has nowhere, back, nowhere to move backwards. All right. Okay, thank you for watching. Uh, this was a chess match with learning chess with the Rochester Chess Center. Now, in this case, the important thing probably was hate. Uh, not to hang any of your pieces. In this case, that one person made a hanging piece and we said, do not hang your pieces or somebody will capture them. And one person made a capture and then he just went for a quick checkmate after that. So the tip of the day here would be don't hang pieces. Uh, thank you for watching and tune in next time for another exciting match. Learn chess with the Rochester Chess Center. Okay, there are several benefits to chess which is, have been documented by research. And we will talk about those benefits later on. But for right now, uh, here's a few of them. One is it encourages players to take their time and not be too impulsive. Another benefit is it helps people visualize what they're going to be doing so they can actually think about the problem before maybe something bad happens. Okay, thank you for watching. Okay, take your queen's mate. No, oh, that was fast. E5. Oh, you, you should have seen our game before. Why did you push me out? Yeah, I, yeah. Blake, literally, we're two moves into the game. Give me a business. Give me a pawn. Okay, thank you. Check me. I will go. They're like 20 moves in.